This is Art in Camelot, a look at the arts in the Kennedy years. I'm Richard Dreyfuss, and in this segment, we'll look at the Kennedy's impact on art in America. Inside the rotunda, President Kennedy still conversing, waiting for his cue to uh, come down the steps to the uh, inaugural platform. It always feels like a new beginning when America swears in a president. But on January 20th, 1961, that feeling was probably greater than it's ever been. People are still entering from the rotunda. Thurston Clark is author of the book Ask Not about President Kennedy's inaugural address. If you just looked at the inauguration platform, you could see here was one of the oldest men to serve as president, and here was the youngest man ever elected president. President Eisenhower was 70 years old that day. President Kennedy was 43. The Marine Corps band gets its signal, and here he comes. We always look for clues on Inauguration Day about what the new administration will bring. And at his swearing-in, President Kennedy gave an unusual signal. He let America know that whatever else it did, the Kennedy administration was going to spend time and attention promoting the arts in America. The president didn't say anything about the arts in his inaugural address itself. But Thurston Clark says he made his point in other ways. He'd asked celebrities to contribute short essays explaining what great music meant to them. Those celebrities included people you'd expect, like opera singer Maria Callas, and people you wouldn't, like Hall of Fame center fielder Mickey Mantle. This has to be an exciting moment for any individual. He also invited 185 artists and thinkers to be special invited guests at his swearing-in. You can imagine there's a lot of political people who want to get those invitations. Elaine Rice Bachman is the director of exhibits at the Maryland State Archives. So when they were divvying out, you know, 50 invitations to writers such as John Steinbeck, you know, W.H. Auden, and philosophers, it was something that was new, a new idea. That was the Reverend Dr. John Barclay, pastor of the Central Christian Church, Austin, Texas. And to make the connection even clearer, the last person to speak before President Kennedy was sworn in wasn't a preacher or a politician. He was a poet. Now I have the honor to present one of America's most distinguished poets, Mr. Robert Frost. Robert Frost was 86 years old and had seen a lot of presidents sworn in. Before he started reading his poem, he spoke about how unusual it was that this president was focusing on the arts. Summoning artists to participate in the august occasions of the state seems something for us all to celebrate. And today is for my cause a day of days. The president followed through on the promise of that inauguration. In the thousand or so days before President Kennedy was killed, opera singers, ballet dancers, and some of the greatest international and American classical musicians all performed at the White House. The famous painting, The Mona Lisa, paid its first and only visit to the United States. The shape of federal art and architecture was changed forever, and the White House went through a renovation that revolutionized the way Americans thought about art history. Grand old man, Robert Ford. We had a poet laureate in this country. He would certainly be it. This embrace of the arts actually started the night before the inauguration when the National Symphony Orchestra played a concert honoring the new president. There was a terrible snowstorm that night, and because of it, Thurston Clark says, the president and Mrs. Kennedy ended up getting to the concert before most of the audience and even the orchestra had straggled in. So the conductor, Howard Mitchell, immediately um, took Kennedy backstage. And uh, Howard Mitchell, at the time, had already praised Kennedy for insisting that this be a concert with only classical music. The program featured a special piece that was the first classical music composition ever commissioned 
for a presidential inauguration. An overture called From Sea to Shining Sea by John Lamantain. critic for the Evening Star commented that the presence of Jack and Jackie at the concert and their choice of its content is a symbol of civilized delight in the arts. Although Jackie enjoyed classical music, really JFK preferred Broadway show tunes, and he also liked the kind of sentimental music from World War II. Mrs. Kennedy had a love of the arts that went back years. Here again is Elaine Rice Bachman of the Maryland State Archives. It was in 1951 when she was in college that she entered Vogue's Prix de Paris contest. The contest asked young women to design an entire issue of Vogue magazine and also write an essay about the impact they wanted to have on the arts. She ended up winning this contest, and in the essay, she said her aspiration was to someday be the overall art director for the 20th century, (laughs) which was so prophetic because in some ways the influence that she had on American culture made her, in a way, definitely a style icon of the 20th century. A tour of the White House with Mrs. John F. Kennedy. In 1962, the First Lady went on TV to show off the results of a year-long project, one she'd started almost immediately after setting foot in her new home. The First Lady-to-be paid a brief visit to the White House for a housekeeping briefing by Mrs. Eisenhower. Elaine Rice Bachman, who wrote a book about the White House renovation, says that visit left Mrs. Kennedy shocked by how ugly the inside of the White House was. She remembered thinking that the downstairs looked like a dentist's office slash bomb shelter. Now, if you'll forgive me, this room looks a little bit like an antique dealer's dream. Have you made any good finds lately? We have. Mrs. Kennedy set about changing the look of the White House completely, replacing the paintings, the wallpaper, and especially the furniture to make it look like it had when its earliest residents had lived there. This chest is rather interesting. This little chest was left by President Van Buren to his grandson. She put together a committee of people from museums and the antique world who raised money and used their connections to bring some of America's most beautiful art and craftsmanship into the White House. They also made a call out to people around the country, asking if they had any furniture that had once been in the White House. They were flooded with responses. Not many people know that Mrs. Lincoln sold a lot of furniture after her husband's death because she was destitute. And one of the ways that we get most of our furniture back is the people who got things at that sale. Those who were a gift to Mrs. Edith McGinnis of Falls Church. Asking people around the country to help redecorate the White House was a smart political move. Elaine Rice Bachman says... It disarmed any critics who might have said the First Lady was wasting money buying furniture. Also, she says... They had people around them who thought this was a great way to present an image, especially for a young president and a young First Lady, to associate themselves with this deeper history. President Hayes was sworn in here as president secretly at night because his was the closest election there ever was. And they didn't want the United States to be without a president for even a day. So while everyone was having dinner, they swore him in here. The president stood behind Mrs. Kennedy's idea to bring beautiful things into the White House. According to Thurston Clark, Kennedy felt that an appreciation of the arts was an important part of being a great president. Kennedy was very competitive with other presidents. He hoped that his presidency was going to surpass that of FDR and Lincoln and Jefferson. Because in in a way, presidents like Jefferson, who had been so adept at writing and had an appreciation for the arts and knew about science, I mean, this was a challenge for Kennedy. Uh, So it just shows you that he was constantly haunted by these people who'd come before who he hoped to equal or surpass. He was motivated by something else, too. 
In the early 1960s, the United States and the Soviet Union were in a fierce competition. The Cold War, which involved pointing nuclear missiles at each other, was also about getting other countries to come over to your side because they liked you better. President Kennedy wanted to show that America was more free than the Soviet Union. His arts policy was one way to do that. In free society, art is not a weapon, and it does not belong to the sphere of polemics and ideology. This is a speech President Kennedy gave at the opening of the Robert Frost Library at Amherst College. There are quotes from this speech carved into the walls of the Kennedy Center in Washington. I look forward to an America which will steadily raise the standards of artistic accomplishment and which will steadily enlarge cultural opportunities for all of our citizens. According to art historian John Wettenhall, at the time of this speech, the Soviet government told artists what to do and restricted what they could and couldn't say or paint or sculpt. Given that sense of censorship and restriction, the free artist in America became a symbol, uh, a greater symbol of American freedoms. If art is to nourish the roots of our culture, society must set the artist free to follow his vision wherever it takes him. We must never forget that art is not a form of propaganda, it is a form of truth. Whatever the motivation, the Kennedy administration did have a profound impact on art in America. Aside from the symbolism of concerts and new furniture, it had a physical impact too. America literally looks different today because of changes made in the Kennedy administration. The center of the city, revived and embellished. Whatever the act, whatever its scope, the common element is design. Today, government gives money to theaters, dance troupes, and art museums. It didn't do that in the 1950s, but it did buy a lot of art, and it also created a lot of art, mostly in the form of buildings and the statues and paintings that went into and in front of them. There have been a set way of constructing those buildings and picking that art for a long time. But John Wettenhall says, In the Kennedy administration, the thinking changed dramatically. The capital of the nation at the far end of a road that respects the beauty of nature. Before Kennedy came into office, courthouses, post offices, and other federal buildings around the country all looked alike. They were built in what's known as a neoclassical style, like those big buildings you see along the inaugural parade route in Washington, D.C. You would have columns and high staircases before the building, and a pediment above within the triangle of the pediment would be statuary that would depict virtue and honor and national ideals. But that style wasn't what America's greatest buildings looked like in the 1960s. President Kennedy understood that there were evolving ideas in the arts of his times. The great buildings of America weren't classical buildings. They were skyscrapers built with steel and glass, many stories high. What you see around you is important, whether the view is from the office, from the home, anywhere. A whole new group of people were given the chance to decide what federal buildings would look like, what paintings went up on their walls, and what kind of sculpture went out in front of them. Call on architects and other design professionals to translate human needs and wishes into a harmony of structures and spaces. The very finest architects and greatest artists were the ones who should establish what constitutes great architecture and great art, not government bureaucrats. You can see this change today in courthouses, post offices, and libraries all over America. Nowhere on a steel and glass building is there a pediment to put classical statuary. Therefore, the kind of ornament that one would put on, on an international-style modern building would have been modern art, abstract sculpture, paintings and the like that looked forward-looking. Regardless of whether it was the president or Mrs. Kennedy or the people around them, 
The Kennedy years and the Kennedy administration touched the arts in important ways, and according to Marta Casals Estoman, the first artistic director of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, made America a better place because of it. We wouldn't have the uh, Arts Council first, the National Endowment. We wouldn't have the Kennedy Center, which is now a central place where the arts are considered in the highest level. We wouldn't have a lot of museums. We wouldn't have a lot of architectural things. And he said, well, this is an element that is very important in our lives. So let us do something to preserve the arts and to give it a growth for the young people. Thanks for listening. I'm Richard Dreyfus for Arts Edge, a program of the Education Department of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. 